Hi everyone, welcome to our accuracy flight test series. Chris from ProFlight Trainer. This uh, video series covers Flight Simulator Steam Edition with the pre-installed Bell 206 Jet Ranger. We are looking at Chapter 1 Flight Dynamics Part 1 Pedals. We are on Chapter Flight Dynamics and doing the pedal test. We're starting with centered pedals takeoff and landing. What we want to see here is do we need the pedal at all for a takeoff? Of course, in a real machine, raising collective will induce torque and make the, the nose spin left or right depends on the direction of pedal of uh, main rotor blade. Sorry, and we want to see how that works. So I'm going to go ahead, take my feet off the pedals, and then just raise collective and take off. I'm going to hover. And you can see, you can easily go in a hover. You can even pull really fast. And there's absolutely no induced spin. The reason the nose is slightly going to the right now is just because my pedal position is not 100% centered uh, from a weight perspective, current weight perspective. So you see, there's absolutely no induced torque here. It's really bad. Torque and RPM influence is the second thing we want to check. We want to see if the power pedal affects our torques and RPM. In the real machine, using the power pedal, you take energy away from the main rotor and other things, and you would have to compensate with collective. So let's see about that. It's going to hover first, like this. That's good. And then I'm going to use power pedal, see if there is an RPM drop. And you can hear it and you can see it. There's absolutely no, no change in RPM whatsoever. This is really bad because in the real machine, and especially if you learn to fly, you want to see a direct influence anytime you use the pedal. Uh, this is super important and this is really bad, it's missing. So, very unrealistic behavior on uh, second point. The third point, is about the main max takeoff weight and empty weight influence. You will need a total different pedal position if you depart with uh, lowest possible weight, which we are uh, now. We are about 2.6. I can remove some fuel to make it even more of a difference. There you go. We're at 2. 1,100, 1,000 pounds under uh, max takeoff weight. And if I depart here, I can pull up with a certain amount of pedal and the helicopter will stay straight. And then I'll go back down and land. Now I will change the fuel configuration to 100%. And then I'm going to go ahead and add payload. Let's say about a couple passenger. We had three one ninety nine, so we're pretty much max takeoff weight. And now, if I depart takeoff like that, I should need much more left foot pedal power pedal to compensate for the weight difference. You can see I haven't change the pedal position, I can still hover with about the exact same amount of pedal. The collective position has changed. I needed much more collective to go in that hover, but the pedal is really bad. Uh, no influence at all, so uh, no change induced. The last things we want to check about pedal that's important is the way. How much do we have to move the pedal for a turn? so that you can get used to a realistic move whenever you do 90 degree turn or if you are in confined area training and you need to uh, do pedal turn to check your area, the, the ground and everything. You want to be close to a real realistic behavior. So I'm just going to go in a hover. Okay. And then uh, let's see if I want to do a 90 degree turn left. That's a bit slow. 
it's true that the, the Bell Jet Ranger usually needs quite some big pedal inputs, so that seems pretty pretty realistic. Pretty good. Let's do a right pedal turn. Looks pretty good. Also going to check uh, if I put full pedal, full left pedal, the acceleration rate and the turn rate seems a bit crazy fast. What about right pedal? Yeah. And to stop the motion. That was a bit of a crazy maneuver. You would never do that in a real machine, of course. But gives you an idea about uh, the distance that you have to move, move on your pedal compared to the, to the real machine. So uh, let's go back on the helipad here. That finishes our pedal test, our four pedal test. I found none of them to be uh, realistic. Pedal test is finished. Uh, moving to the next chapter, next section, sorry, which will be RPM. We're on chapter one, flight dynamics, section two, RPM. We want to check a couple things about RPMs here. First, uh, reaction collective input. This is uh, important when you are in hover and you would have a high rate of climb or descent, straight up, straight down. You see a lot of RPM fluctuation going on. Uh, just a no uh, note about the scenery. I'm sorry, it doesn't look super nice, but this is India, 10,000 feet, and I think it's um, much better on the environment to push the engine and the dynamics to the limit so you should see a much more wider range of change and fluctuation in RPMs. So I'm just going to go ahead here, pick up the machine and then I'm just going to go for a straight up, uh, straight down and do up again and you can see there's very little to absolutely no RPM fluctuations. So that's it for the first check. We see almost no RPM fluctuation with very directive collective inputs. Let's do the level flights and see if there is any change while actually flying. More or less on a steady cruise and level flight. So climbing a bit. All right. So I'm going to go ahead here, raise collective even further and lower. Further. I see absolutely no RPM change indication. The sound remains the same. Everything remains the same. I'm going to move to the next test which is RPM reaction in flare. If you flare at full speed, full cruise speed, or even less, you'll see a high RPM increase. And uh, of course, this is due to the airflow. And you wanna have this in the simulator to train yourself, your ear, and your habits. Because if you don't train that, and if you do a full flare in the real machine, you're gonna overspeed the rotor pretty fast. So I'm just going to pick up speed here. That's already pretty good. And then I do a quick stop style. And you see no no RPM change so far. If I do the same with a spin turn, pick up speed, and do a high bank turn there you go very high bank turn much more much more than you would like to do in in real life there's absolutely little or no rpm change at all 
very disappointing. So what's next? We want to see a throttle separation while starting up or closing throttle fast and reopening throttle through auto rotation. Needle separation can be very helpful because when you get into emergency training then you want to see a clear needle split and also the noise would be very indicative that you had a needle split. I'm not quite sure how F6 is going to handle that one. I'm still quite low, heavy weight, and let's go ahead and see. <laughs> All right. So, okay, that's what happened. Uh, not sure what comment to give. Uh, as far as I've seen, there is a needle split during startup and during shutdown you can have a needle split too. But during the auto rotation, the needle split is not very clear, quite confusing. And uh, it doesn't, you probably can't really just slightly decrease throttle and train like uh, governor failures and these kind of things. So, it's a no go. Looks like we'll have to reload here reload the flight there you go next is uh, our loaded disk approach we want to fly a flat shallow approach at high altitude for that I'm just gonna check my full weight because I have the feeling that we're not gonna go much further up from here with the jet ranger so that's better Let's put 10. We don't want to crash while landing. There you go. And we want to see, is there a difference? Is there a difference on RPM behavior if we go to a very high peak and try to land with a shallow approach or with a very direct approach. The idea behind is if you go land on a very high place or with limited power and you have you don't do a shallow approach then your disk RPM and speed are in a let's say not very close to max collective input setup which means once you approach the ground you'll have to reduce speed and everything and you'll end up losing a lot of RPM and you'll probably make a hard landing. While if you come on a shallow approach, your disc will already be loaded, that's how it's called, and then all you need to do is slightly decrease collective and land. So you're not taken by surprise, the engine doesn't have to overcompensate and usually it's a good, it's a much better approach style. So let's see. Let's aim at the uh, apron. Still pretty fast. The speed is decreasing. You can see that the descending rate is very little, very little descent rate, the speed's coming down, collectives being raised. We should kind of feel the ground effect by now and then just slide in with as little power as possible. It's almost like a slide, slide on landing. There you go. So that needed about 10, 20, 30, 35 to 40 percent torque. Now I'm going to do the same. I hope fuel is not going to run out. But I'm just going to do a huge high angle steep approach and see if there is any difference.
no loaded disk, I have to flare a lot and collective is raised, but there's no real there's no real difference. There's no difference here. I don't see any difference here. I don't see any difference at all. Let's see about over limits. Uh, it's nice to have some uh, behavior and warnings and con uh, if you over limits R RPM just uh, nice to have it. Many small training helicopter have it. So if you don't have one in the sim, you're just gonna freak out if you uh, hear it the first time in the machine. Let's see what happens here. The thing is, I was never able to over accelerate the RPM with any maneuver I did. So I don't even know if there is a kind of over limit. I guess there isn't. Because this is the kind of maneuver with low pitch, high banking turn, and stuff like that. We would have over speed many times, but it doesn't do anything. Let's see about the other way. I'm gonna just gonna get some altitude quick here. And No warning, or oh, there is a <laughs> there's a warning light. There you go, we died. There's a warning light, but there is no audible sound. The warning light isn't really helpful because if you go on high confined area, your focus is totally to the outside, to the environment, and everything. And you listen with one ear to the sound. You get to used to the RPM limits, and you hear when you're losing RPM and we're getting in trouble. So. Uh, audible warning is much better than uh, light, so no warning here. And that closes our uh, section about RPM. Next up will be collective. This is still flight dynamic. We're looking at section collective with a couple tests. First test is about torque relation, no tendency. The nose tendency whenever applying collective should be direct and significant. So the smaller machine, the bigger the ten tendency usually. And we want to make sure that uh, we will see. We'll see it. First, I'm going to establish high hover. Okay, let's go a bit higher than that. So now, I want to see, whenever I have a collective inputs, that uh, there will be a no tendency. And you can see, I can go even almost past collective limits. The nose will stay steady. I have absolutely no left-right motion. This is super important to see, and you'll notice when you start flying the real machine that Anytime you move collective just slightly, you'll see a nose tendency. This is uh, very important because you'll have to give pedal inputs. And if you don't learn to coordinate those pedal and collective motion, you'll be bad. You'll look bad when you go for your hover exercise. No nose tendency here. Very unrealistic behavior. The next is uh, torque and manifold reading. We'll do takeoff and landing at common density altitude, and then we want to see is that somehow similar to what we are used to see. Now, last time I flew the Jet Ranger is a while ago. I'm loading the airport I flew at, and I'm going to double check fuel and payload. I usually I would depart with about 80% fuel for sightseeing tours and most of the time five passengers with about an average weight and then some baggage but not much let's see close to max takeoff weight that's correct let's see how much torque we need here to lift up and let's see if this is somehow realistic. 
usually it should be just below below uh, yellow range now for takeoff of course you can go for five minutes all the way to the red but still just as a fair comparison and if if I want to go out of ground effect hoggy start or hoji start against hiji start that's somehow close to what I've been used to see now there should be a significant significant difference on performance for takeoff and landing in high altitude hot day conditions of course and I can see that if I remove quite some weight let's say returning to the base then oh I'm sorry then uh, there will be a big difference and you could see it here actually just changed slightly the the weight configuration sorry about that I think it's still about the same 20% and passenger there you go you can see that I need much less torque to lift it off the ground 10-15% less so that's pretty pretty realistic I would say and close to the real machine so a good point here next we want to check the vertical climb rates and monitor how much we can achieve I guess that my I'm gonna go for a 85% max cruise setting and maybe about 50 55 cruise should be bring us close to the max max rates and we're climbing at let's pause and go closer here to see we're already climbing at 1500 feet a minute which is uh, pretty fast but seems since we have only 20 percent fuel left seems pretty good to me now if I change fuel configuration again and put it back to the 80% we have we should see a decrease in that rate and I'll probably have to compensate on the control a little bit let's see what happens back closer and you can see it dropped below 1000 feet of course this is just a fast check you could do it much more accurate but it gives you an idea that weight will have a quite an influence on your climb climb rates you could do also a vertical climb I mean no forward motion at all and check how much you could go but this gives you a good idea that uh, reproduction of climb rates and power that you have here for that model is pretty close to the real machine and that closes our section for collective next will be cyclic still on flight dynamics we want to check three things about the cyclic takeoff hover position you know that most helicopter have cyclic position tendencies due to the main rotor design and other reasons for example uh, on the air flight I fly now on the A-star you'll have this tendency for the mass that push you to the left so you kind of have the right skid back side as a last touching point or first touching point on entry landings and you want to see if the simulator replicates those tendencies bells will have those tendency too to push you to one side and usually when you go in hover you'll have to do a slight static adjustment to stay at the same position let's see if we can do that so here I'm gonna try to do as smooth as I can and see what happened so here you have a slight adjustment and then the helicopter wants to go to the right and I have to push a little bit to the left do it one more time 
It's nice that in simulator you can load land in the middle of a road. <laughs> You'd never do that in real life. Or at least not here. Yes. So from a middle position there is this movements. Tiny bit to the left. But the skids kind of come down at the same time. In your real machine usually one lift one skid will lift up first even if it's just a little bit. Depend on the on your surface of course if you're already in the slope that will come say for that. I don't see much of a different cyclic position in hover than uh, centered and one skid down. So not really very uh, realistically done here. Next we want to check is translating tendency we want to do a slow smooth acceleration in ground effect and as translating comes in translating lift comes in you'll have to compensate with cyclic forward most of the time unless uh, if you do if if you don't do that you're, you'll have a nose up tendency and you'll don't perform a smooth takeoff so let's see how that works if there's no translating tendency, then you just can continue with the same cyclic inputs. So I'm just going to go a slow, slow, slow forward motion. There you go. Should probably hit by 20, 25 right now. I can continue my takeoff. I haven't touched cyclic at all. And you can see I can still take off as if there would be no translating tendency. Same when you come uh, in for the approach in ground effect. You would have this tendency too. Means that at some point you will lose translating tendency and then you'll have to compensate with collective and other inputs. And As we can see here, if, even if I come on a slow and steady approach, I don't have this large cyclic input just when you lose tendency to remain in track. If you don't do that in real life, if you don't compensate with cyclic forward while landing and getting out of translating left, then the helicopter will probably start to move backwards here I never really had to do any compensation for that. Very unrealistic. That's bad. The last thing we want to check is slope landings. We want to see if we can uh, touch with one ski down and see if we can do a transition from one skid to full landing. That might be a bit difficult because I know that Flight Simulator X have some issue with ground so you might see a slope but it doesn't necessarily mean that you'll be able to put your skids in and then go all the way down let me go closer to that uh, to that hill here see what happened if I can uh, can go let's go nose up first it's usually the easiest to check and most helicopter have the highest angle always nose up that's due to mass construction limitations. Okay, there we go. We have the skid in the slow. I'm going to move forward cyclic, collective down, forward cyclic, collective down. There you go. On the ground. And then to go back up, I'll have to go cyclic into the slope, so cyclic forward all the way forward, collective coming and then cyclic coming back and then I want to lift up and away from the slope as soon as possible. By the way we have another video on our YouTube channel that shows real real life inputs when I flew the A-Star into the slope to demonstrate fly controls input so if you're interested in that make sure to visit our channel and check out check those videos the cyclic inputs on the nose up slope was pretty realistic I would say I would 
I would have to put the cyclic into the slope and I was able to go skid first. Uh, let's see if we can do a sideway things, sideways slope landing. Might be a bit more tricky, I don't really see very well where I am. And the slope might be a bit too slopey. Let's go slowly. There you go, we have one skid down. Oh, that was a bit fast. But it's doable. I guess I should do like this. Oh man, <laughs> that's quite a bit of a slope. Again, the visual can sometimes be a bit strange. Uh, that is due just to the way it works here. So now, cyclic into the slope, slow collective, raising a one skid hover. There you go, cyclic is coming in the middle. Continually raise collective and then away from slope. And then back to a flat, more or less flat landing. It's not a hundred percent flat landing. The road is going down a bit here. But the point of the test was to demonstrate a slope landing and they're perfectly doable and you can train procedures even if the visual reference if you look outside don't match 100% what you would expect. You can still train yourself with the correct procedure, cyclic into slope, collective and cyclic coordination etc. So that's pretty good and it closes our uh, cyclic tests. Next will be sensitivity of the controls. We're still in flight dynamics. We're looking at sensitivity of controls. We want to do a couple of ground maneuvers and uh, feel if the movements done on cyclic seems accurate to what we have experienced in real life. The Jet Ranger is not the most sensitive helicopter. If you fly Robinson, A Star, or maybe even MD500, you'll feel the flight controls much more direct on the inputs. Nevertheless, we want to see if uh, we can get there. I want to remind everyone that it will be super important to have the settings in sensitivity and null zone on FSX set to the max and to zero. If you don't do that, of course, sensitivity itself will be uh, really bad. And then, depends on your flight controls, I'm using the Puma calibrated and that will give me a normal range on cyclic, most important cyclic inputs. So let's see. First hover hover inputs. Now because this Jet Ranger, the default Jet Ranger pre-installed with Flight Simulator X is pretty stable, I almost have to do nothing on the cyclic and nothing at all on the pedals because of a lack of torque. So really it doesn't really show me how sensitive the control are. I'm going to try to do a left pedal turn here and see, move forward a bit and then stop by the fence or close to the fence combined with a right turn, see if I can easily and precisely come over that fence here as I would do in a real world maneuver. Actually it's pretty doable. I feel like I have to give a bit too big of a cyclic inputs. Pedal seems pretty good as we tested already. Collective doesn't feel too bad either. I guess if I would like to increase this input sensitivity even more, I could just calibrate the flight controls so that they would not use the full available range on cyclic. It means that even smaller movement would mean bigger inputs in the helicopter afterwards. But all in all, the input itself is pretty good, I would say, compared to my what I recall from flying the Jet Ranger. The problem comes from the ultra stable helicopter dynamically almost 
100% is stable, like he, there would be gyros installed on the machine, and thus I don't really need those huge or sensitive inputs that I would need in the real machine. So the input themselves, the control themselves, seems pretty good. The problem is that uh, because the helicopter is way too stable, especially in hover, uh, you could think, you could train with it and think that you would manage to hover and when you hop in the real machine you realize, oh wait, this thing is much more uh, or much less stable than I'm used to. That's it for sensitivity. We have also the section 6 talking about special equipment. VR is available for Flight Simulator X as for now, so that's a good point. With it, you can really immerse into the cockpit and train vertical reference and things like that. And you can do vertical reference and sling with F6 that's included, so that's good. I don't really see any special equipment with this helicopter. The buttons and everything are pretty to the minim minimum that you can have, so I'm not going to give any additional point here. And section 7, I have the chance to talk about personal judgment and opinion based on my real life experience, how close the helicopter behaves to the real thing. Uh, there's nothing that comes to my mind that uh, I haven't said yet, yet already on the flight dynamics video. I feel like the, the biggest issue, if I summarize it, is the lack of torque and induced torque and pedal uh, movement. And really, if that gets sorted out, that actually the helicopter doesn't behave too bad. It's a bit too stable and a huge lack of torque make it really a bad choice if you really want to learn to fly helicopters but beside that everything else is uh, pretty close to the real thing.